But welcome. Glad you're all here again tonight. We're going over the woman and a bit more about that in a second. Um, but just uh, as we look forward to the upcoming topics that are going to come about and take place, tomorrow night is the gift of prophecy. You won't want to miss that, that topic. Um, and I'll talk just a very briefly about that tonight, and then we're going to go into a full detailed presentation about it tomorrow. And um, I'm not exactly sure if any of you have ever heard it the way that I have presented it, um, but I've heard by many, many church members in the past uh, that the way I present it is different than they've heard it before, uh, at least some aspects of it. And so maybe it'll be something new for you. Uh, but anyways, we welcome you to come back tomorrow at 7 to hear that presentation. So that'll be Friday night at 7 p.m. And then tonight's topic is the woman. Oops, I forgot to change my slide. It's supposed to be the woman in white. I know it says woman in red up there, but it's supposed to be the woman in white. So I didn't change that from last night. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but anyways, it is the woman in white, and I know what presentation we're going into, and this will be the right one, I think. Yes, this will be the right one. All right. But before we get into it, do you guys mind if we just bow our heads really quick and pray? Dear Father, we are so grateful for all that you do for us and for uh, leading us in the direction that you've led us and for bringing us here tonight and giving us this opportunity to grow in you and to walk closer with you um, and to really just uh, continue this journey that you started us on, Lord. You said that you had finished the work in which you've begun, and we're in the process of you doing that, and we thank you for that, and we look forward to walking on the streets of gold very soon with you in your home, Father, where you've created mansions for us. But tonight, as we go into this topic, we ask above all that you send us your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would come and move on our hearts, move on our minds, open our hearts, opens our minds, open our ears to, to understand and to hear and to be moved into action, Father. Forgive us where we have fallen short and give us grace to move forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so we're talking about the woman in white, not the woman in red. And last night I gave you the teaser story. It's talking about this lady. Her name is Angie Dinapolis, and I can share this story freely because she's given me permission. Normally I wouldn't share her name, but because she's given me permission and said that I can, I will. Her name was Angie Dinapolis, and she was just a wonderful, sweet lady. She was a Catholic. She was raised Catholic, grew up Catholic, married Catholic, stayed Catholic. Like I said, she she was a nurse in a hospital, but she also uh, used to get there early and pray for all the nurses and pray for all the doctors and pray for all the patients on her wing. She was very faithful. She used to do prison ministries. If the church doors were open to her church, she would go in there and she would pray. She would go do Bible studies and be very involved. She was extremely involved in the church. She didn't have any kind of, uh, any kind of, um, luxurious lifestyle. She, she wasn't pompous in any way. She's just a very sweet, genuine, wonderful woman. And she was a Catholic and she knew that she wasn't hearing the whole truth. And so she came to a set of series much like this one. And she'd been hearing truth. She'd been hearing many things that she knew were right because she'd seen them in God's word. And the Holy Spirit was convicting her along the way. And she knew that she's going to have to make some changes. And she was willing to make those changes, but she was concerned because she didn't want to be church hopping all of a sudden. She wanted to go from where she was into where she was going to be for the rest of her life. She wanted to go from where she was, the Catholic Church, into the true church, if there is one, she asked. And she wanted to know, she didn't want to do this over and over and over again. She wanted to know, how will I know if I'm in the right church? How will I know, because I can't keep doing this over and over again, if I get rebaptized into your church, will I get rebaptized again a year later or two years later? I want to know before I make any such decision. And tonight, the good news for you is that it will be very clear which church Jesus would go to if he walked this earth today and which church he's calling his people to. And of course, our source of truth is the what? Bible. The Bible. So we allow the Bible to dictate all that for us. But bef um, I, 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 need, I need you to know before I go any further, I need to know. Does God have a remnant church on earth today? So let's just explain this really quick. What is a remnant? Is there any uh, craft people or, or seamstresses or seamsters, I guess, or people who work with fabrics in this, in this, in this building tonight? Is there anybody who does that in here? So, so there's a couple. So when we're talking about a remnant, what is that talking about? 
It's talking about a piece that's left over off the original roll, right? So you'll order materials and you'll get those materials and you'll get the original pattern. And then there'll be a remnant that's left over. And sometimes the shop will keep those remnants and they'll sell them at discounted prices. It could be carpet, it could be many things, or they'll offer you that remnant in case something goes wrong and you want to patch something at a later time. It's a remnant and that is an exact copy of the original or exact, exactly like the original or part of the original. That's what remnant is. And so the question is, does Jesus have a remnant church today? Now, when we talk about a remnant church, that would mean what? That there was an authentic, true church at one point, something would happen, and then there would be a remnant at the end of time. What was the original true church? What would that represent? Not only the Christian church, because we would all call ourselves Christians, but yes, I believe I know what you're going to. It would be the church that the apostles started right after the ascension of Jesus Christ, after they walked with Jesus and did ministry with them for three and a half years. Then he commissioned them to go out into the outer regions of the world and start this new church. And that's the church that they started. And then that would be the original, that would be the, the, the original copy would there be a remnant that would come after that? That's the question that we need to look at. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 16, and other sheep, now really quick, who are sheep in the Bible? Who are sheep? Not just people, because there's other people that are in the, sheep, in, in the Bible too, but who are the sheep in the, in the Bible? They are those who believe in Jesus Christ. He refers to them as sheep, right? He is the shepherd. They are his sheep. And Jesus says, I have other sheep. So that means I have other people or other believers out there who follow me, he says. I have which are not of this fold. So he says, I have these true believers. They're out there. They're followers of me. They're genuine, but they're not of what? This fold. He says, no, they're not here, but they're out there. And then he continues on, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and what? One shepherd. So how many flocks does Jesus want? One. And are there sheep out there that are not in his flock? Yes, according to Jesus. So he says, I have other sheep out there, other followers of me, other believers of me. They're out there in the world, and I, they, they're, but I'm going to bring them also to this one flock. So Jesus himself says that there is one true church, one church, and I have other believers out there, and I'm going to bring them where? To this flock or to this church. So um, all through time, God has had faithful followers who worship him. In Genesis 26, 5, we read, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my what? Commandments, my statutes, and my laws. God has always had his people in every age. Noah and his family, Abraham and his family, and so on and so forth. He had the Jews. He had uh, you know, a, a group of people all through time who, time who followed him. And here is the characteristic of God's people. They obey his voice and they keep his commandments. In Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, he's speaking, Therefore you, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments, what? Always. So the characteristic of God's people of all time is what? Love for God. And when you come to the New Testament period, God still has a special people that he says will love me and they will keep my commandments. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. So Peter's talking, he says there's going to be these special people. These were people he saved from darkness. And it goes on to say that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous what? Light. Light. So God has always had his people from the days of Abraham to the New Testament church. But what about today? Does does he have, or is there a group, does the Bible identify a special people of God's today? Does God have a last day movement on earth today? If there are faithful people in every age of the church, is there, and there, they are an identifiable body, if he does with the maze of churches, how would you be able to identify it? In other words, if God does have this faithful group out there, and we know they'd be called Christians because that means to be a follower or believer in Jesus, and the Bible is all about who? About Jesus. So these would be followers of Jesus, therefore they'd be Christians. But in North America alone, there's 
myriads and myriads of different denominations, how would you find the true church? How would you find this one flock that Jesus is pointing you to? And where would you even know to look? Before we go further, we need to talk about a certain principle. As an eternal principle, now this is very important to understand this, pre the, the, this phrase or this premise. Very important to understand this principle or this premise right here to know what you're looking for in God's church. As an eternal principle, you do not go to the church to find the truth. You go to where? The Bible. Brothers and sisters, you don't go to the church to find the truth. You go where? To the Bible. To find the truth. When you find the truth, you look for a church that teaches what? The truth. So we're not saying that you shouldn't find truth in a church, but the church does not define truth. What defines truth? The Bible. What is our source of truth? The Bible or God's worth. What is our safe guide through this world that we live in? The Bible or God's word. So anytime we're trying to uh, identify a doctrine, anytime we're trying to identify truth, anytime we're trying to identify a true church, where would we go to find that? We would go to a Bible. And if I went to the Bible and it clearly identified or it marked where I was supposed to be, then I would go to a place that taught that truth. Amen? If I was reading in the Bible and I was a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, if, if I went to a church but I was a follower of Jesus Christ and that church told me that I was supposed to denounce my faith or it was acceptable for me to denounce my faith, if it meant that I could gain the world, would that be truth? No, it would absolutely not be true if that church would be an error. And if I knew that church was an error, would I want to continue going to the church that was preaching error? No, I'd want to go to a church that is representing the Bible or God's word and teaching truth. That's the church that I'd be comfortable being. in. That's the church that I'd want to be in. Does that make sense to you? So as an eternal principle, you do not go to the church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. When you find the truth, you look for a church that teaches that truth. So, can't I worship at home? And next questions are going to come up. Many people ask, once I have truth, can't I worship at home? Does it make a difference if I come to church? Hebrews 10.25, the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, what? Together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day here is talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Paul says in his counsel to us in Hebrews under inspiration, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Brothers and sisters, you have a special unique talent that God has given you or special unique talents that God has given you to edify the saints, to edify the church, to edify the other sheep. God wants to use you to prop up others, to encourage others, to teach others, to edify them and prepare them for his second coming. And likewise, he wants others to share their gifts that he's given to them with you to edify you, to comfort you and to prop you up and to make you ready for his second coming. And he says the best place to do that is in my church. So you can't just sit at home and say, I have truth, everything's fine. Jesus himself says, no, 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 no. You belong in the church. That's where I want you to be. I want you to be there constantly. I want you to assemble together. And that's where you're going to be equipped fully and edified fully for what I want you to do. So we don't find any safety in staying at home because God does not want us to be Lone Ranger Christians. This pastor went to visit this person who had uh, not been coming to church for a while. And as he got there, the gentleman invited him in. And, and the pastor said, so how come we haven't seen you in church? It's been a while since we've seen you. And he says, well, I don't think I have a need for church. I think I'm okay. I know the truth. And I can just worship at home. It's more convenient. It's more comfortable for me. And the pastor says, well, how is your spiritual life? And he says, oh, it's good. It's good. He says, well, what does that look like? Are you praying every day? Well, most every day. Okay, are you reading your Bible every day? Well, not as much as I would like, Pastor. And he says, do you feel like you're growing closer to God? And he said, not really. And he says, well, then you should come back to church. And he says, well, how can church help me? And as the pastor was talking to him, he noticed a man's wood stove. And he said, do you mind if I open up that door? So he opened up the door and he pulled a hot coal out of the wood stove and he placed it on top of the wood stove. And the man said, what are you doing? And he says, well, watch, what's it doing? He says, well, it's going dead. And the pastor then put it back in the wood stove. And he says, now what's it doing? Well, it's going again, pastor. I get it. I'll be in church. Paul defines the church in 1 Timothy. 
3.15. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. But wait a minute, you just said the Bible is the truth and not the church. And this is true, but the pillar means it's a supporting position. Um, it's what holds it up or upholds the truth. So the church is designed not to be the source of truth, but to uphold hold the truth that it's getting from God's word or from the source of God. That's the purpose of the church. And it's also supposed to ground people or firmly establish them in a certain place. So where does the church get its truth to uphold and establish people in? John 17, 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your what is truth? Your word is true. So brothers and sisters, right off the bat, you already know where this is going. If you are looking for God's true church, what should be its source of truth? Now, if it's teaching things that are not found in the Bible, is that, do you have confidence in being there? Is that the place that is upholding and establishing people in truth? The answer is no, because if it's not following the word that God gave them, then what truth is it referring to? And if their truth that they are teaching contradicts what's in this word right here, is it God's truth? The answer is no, it would not be God's truth. Now, these people would be wonderful, sincere people, and I'm sure there, are, there are many are out there, but they're sincerely deceived, and that's the problem. And while we're on this topic about being deceived, does the devil ever just come straight at you with just a straight lie? The answer is no. He always mingles truth with error. And the reason why he always mingles truth with error is because if there was no truth in what he was saying, nobody would believe it. Everybody would be able to see that it's a lie and they would run away. But he counterfeits everything and he tries to mingle it so close that he can mix his subtle deceptions in there and he's very crafty, he's very subtle, and he's very deceptive and he's very good at deceiving people. So I'm not saying that people have ill intentions of going to this other church or not even teaching truth. But what I am saying is that once you learn truth, once you see truth in the Bible, and then you go somewhere where they're not teaching truth, is there any safety in being there? The answer is no, because if they're deceived on that point, what else may they be deceived on that they are teaching? The answer is, I don't know, and neither do you, and neither do they. God's true church is based on the foundation of Scripture. His true church will follow the Bible and not the doctrine of man. This is John Miller in the end of Religious Controversies, page 95. There is but inquiry to be made, namely, which is the true church. By solving this one question, you will at once solve every question of religious controversy that has ever been or that can ever be or that ever can be agitated. We have already seen that there is a true church, but how would we find this church? How do we settle the controversy in our own minds? Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you what? Free. Free. So the question is, does Jesus want us to know truth? The answer is yes, because he came to set free the captives. He kept to set free um, those who were in prison. Jesus wants you to know the truth because it's by knowing the truth that you are set free. So, of course, he, he will. He went through villages healing everyone, one in the village from sick, everyone in the village from sickness and cast out demons. And Jesus longs and lives to set you free. And if his truth is one of the agents to set you free, then you can be assured that he will make it plain to you if you are seeking for it. Somebody uh, confirmed. Does that make sense? Thank you. I'm running out of words up here. I don't know why. The Bible says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the what? Doctrine. So Jesus says there's a very simple condition for understanding truth. There's a very simple condition for finding truth. And that condition is what? You've got to be willing to follow it. If you are willing to follow, God says, I'm going to make sure you find truth. If you are willing to follow me, if you're willing to surrender to me, if you're willing to do what I want to show you, I'm going to make sure that that truth comes to you one way or another. Now, it may come through a series like this. You might just turn this on. You might be on Facebook or YouTube, and all of a sudden this pops on. You're like, huh, that sounds like truth. That can be one way that God is trying to get truth to you. It could be you sit down with your Bible one afternoon or one evening or morning or whatever it is, and you start reading, and you read something you've never read before, and you're like, that looks different than what I've seen. That sounds like truth. Maybe I should walk in it, and God will reveal truth to you. Or it may be a friend. It may be a coworker. I don't know what it is, but if you have a heart that's willing to do the will of God, God says, it's my responsibility now to make sure that you know the what? 
the truth. So, understanding the Bible has little to do with how intelligent you are, intelligent you are and much more to do with your desire to follow what you learn. Revelation 12 tells us how God's last day church tells us about God's last day church. Revelation 12 is like a movie, but more fascinating than any other Hollywood movie. It has four episodes in it. And as we go through the four episodes, we will discover the identification of God's church. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12 in our Bibles tonight. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. We're going to look at the four episodes of Revelation chapter 12, and in doing so, we're going to identify the remnant church, or God's true church, or like I like to tell people, the church that Jesus would go to if he were on earth today. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I hear a lot of people getting there. I'm close. I'm in Revelation 11 right now. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, in verse 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give what? Birth. So we introduced to this woman, again, we, we talked briefly about this last night, but she's clothed with the sun, with the moon under her foot, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Now this is a different, this would be... Um, very different clothing than we see most women wearing. I've never seen a woman wear the sun. I've seen them wear sundresses. I've seen them wear yellow. I've seen them wear all sorts of things that look like the sun. I've never seen them wear the sun. So obviously this is symbology of something different. And who is the son of righteousness according to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2? Jesus Christ. So this woman is representing Jesus, or not representing Jesus, but wearing Jesus, or, you know, is, is clothed in Jesus. And the, and the woman um, with the moon under her feet, what is the, 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 the job of the moon at night? To light up the, the sky at nighttime, and it reflects what? The sun, the light of the sun. So this moon under her feet is to reflect the light of the sun that she's been given. And then she has a garland of 12 stars around her head. Any guesses on what that is? The 12 apostles. Close. It's the 12 apostles. This is New Testament, not the Old Testament. So the 12 tribes would have been the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the 12 apostles started the church of God. So these 12 stars are the apostles. So... In the Bible, prof in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. Now, we looked at this last night, but we're going to look at it again. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you to Christ as a what? Chaste virgin. So when we see a woman in Revelation, it equals what? A church. Having said that, let's go um, to episode one. Episode 1 in Revelation chapter 12 starts in verses 7 through 9. 7 through 9. Now understand this, that the Greeks were not concerned about chronological order like English, English Westerners are. They, they were concerned more about the plot line and the drama in the plot line and delivering you at the spot that they wanted you to be in the moment they wanted you there. And they were, didn't have the same kind of sentence structure that we do. And therefore you find episode 1 further down in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, we are going to look at the first episode. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 9. The Bible says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But when they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of all called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were what? Cast out with him. So episode one, there's a rebellion in heaven. It culminates in a great fight between Michael and his angels and the dragon who is Satan and his angels. And in episode one, Jesus wins and Satan loses. Jesus wins and Satan loses. The good news is in every so in Revelation chapter 12, Jesus always wins. Is, um, is the devil doing battle in your life? Is the devil doing battle with your health? Is the devil doing battle in your home, with your finances, with your kids? Whatever it may be, the good news for you from Revelation chapter 12 tonight is that Jesus always wins. 
There may be a time in your life where it seems like he's losing. There may be a time in your life where it seems like the devil's being successful for a while. But the good news is, is Revelation 12 gives us the confidence that no matter what takes place in a particular moment, Jesus always wins. And someday he's going to set the record straight. He's going to end the battle between him and Satan. And the devil will be destroyed forever. And so will sin. So first scene, the first episode in Revelation 12 is rebellion in heaven. Let's move on to the second scene. Revelation 12, 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Oh, sorry, I'm going too far. I've got ahead of you. Sorry. So, uh, God's celestial camera focuses now on the scene of Jesus' birth. What happened after Jesus was born? What happened shortly after Jesus was born? Wise men came from the east looking for who? For Jesus or the Messiah. And they come on their way and they stop in Jerusalem to ask the religious leaders, where is the Messiah supposed to be born at? We have seen a sign. We know that he's here, but we don't know where he's supposed to be at. But you guys will know because this is your Messiah. This is your king. And as he sees this, Herod acts like he's curious. He acts like he's interested in worshiping. But what was Herod really doing? He was trying to find out where this king was so he could kill him. When the wise men did not return to tell Herod where this king was, he said, you go on your way. When you find him, come back and give me news so I can worship him. But an angel said, don't do that. Just go the other direction. So the wise men left and went the other direction. Then Herod sent out a decree, and that decree was to do what? Kill all the male babies, two years old and younger. In the second scene of Revelation, Satan again works through the political powers of the time, and he tries to defeat Jesus. He tries to destroy the church before it can even get started. But again, in Revelation, or in the second scene of Revelation chapter 12, Jesus wins, Satan loses. Going on to episode chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Revelation 12, 12 through 13. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, looking at the third episode in Revelation 12, the Bible says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Now, why are they rejoicing? We read it earlier in verse 7, because the dragon and his angels have been what? Cast out of heaven. So now the angel is saying, listen, heaven, you can rejoice, because you don't have to deal with this problem anymore. But now look what he says. He has a very grim warning for planet Earth. He goes on and he says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has what? A short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who was the woman in Bible prophecy? The church. He persecuted the church who gave birth to the male child. So as soon as he realizes that he can't destroy Jesus before his mission even gets started, then he turns his attention not on Jesus, but on who? On the church, those who represent Jesus. And he says, I know what I'll do. I couldn't kill Satan. I couldn't kill Jesus. But I'll snuff out this church before it gets started. I will persecute those people so bad that they will quit trying to spread the gospel. So Satan, through Roman leaders, through Roman political parties, sent persecution out for all of God's people in the early stages of the Christian church, even feeding them to lions and different beasts and, and just slaughtering them from soldiers all the time, trying to snuff out this religion. But would it destroy God's church? Would it end God's church? The answer is no. He may have won a couple battles, but he's still losing the war. In episode three, Jesus wins, Satan loses. All but one of the disciples died a martyr's death. Every single disciple that followed Jesus, every single one, including Paul, who was a disciple later, every one of them died a martyr's death except for John. And they tried killing John. It just didn't work. God miraculously intervened and preserved John's life. They threw him in boiling oil in hopes that it would kill him, but God would not allow him to die. And so instead of 
you know, instead of killing him, when they said, we've just seen a miracle, we don't want to go there, they banished him to Patmos. And when they thought that they had won, when Satan said that this will work, we'll just confine the last disciple and the truth won't be able to get out. The truth will be stuck on an island, a, a, a desolate, uh, uh, um, secluded island out in the middle of the sea. We'll just stick him out there and the truth won't be able to get out. Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. You still haven't learned your lesson yet. You can't beat me that easy. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit, and he's going to give John a vision. And now, because John was banished to the island of Patmos, we have the book of Revelation, or the book that offers us hope and comfort in the end times. Brothers and sisters, what times do we live in? In the end times. And Jesus says, I'm going to have a special book just for you. Satan thought that he was winning the war, but again, Jesus wins, Satan wins loses. Satan could no longer reach Jesus, so he turned his fury upon the church on the earth. Church and state unites in the days of Constantine. Compromise comes into the church. Images come in. Then the church tries to reinforce or tries to enforce worship of man's ideas. This is the history of the Pope, volume 2, page 334. Great numbers of Christians were driven from their habitations with their wives and children. They were stripped naked. Many of them were inhumanely massacred. The Bible tells us exactly what happened to this woman, the church, but just when things were at their worst, Jesus intervened. You guys have heard this quote before. It's the most misquoted quote of, most, of all quotes that I've ever heard. This one is misquoted the most often. In, in October, on October 29th, 1941, Winston Churchill, on the, on the eve, or I'm sorry, on, on, the, on, the, on the day after a great loss, a great disappointment, a great loss in the war effort of World War II with the Germans, he said the most misquoted speech ever to a school of boys. He said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never in nothing, great or small, large or petty. Never give in, and ex it, it, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparent apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has this message for you, and it comes straight from Winston Churchill. Never give in. Never, never, never. Don't give up because in every scene of Revelation chapter 12, the devil loses and Jesus wins. It may seem like you're on the verge of losing. It may seem like the battle's almost over, but in that moment, Jesus will step in. Churchill gave that, that speech October 29th, 1941. And then just a few weeks later, on December 7th, 1941, you all know what happened. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, the Americans entered the war, and then the tides turned towards the Allies, and eventually the Allies won the war. Never give in. Jesus is still in control, and he hasn't lost a battle yet. So how do we identify the remnant of the pure woman or the church? The, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Every time the devil attacked, the woman would go into hiding. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Revelation 12, verse 6, the Bible says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for how long? 1260 days. Does that sound familiar? That number sound familiar to anybody in here? That is a repeated number in Bible history. So we're going to look at it again. But this woman or this church would be persecuted by Satan, but she would go into the wilderness or she would find shelter, in other words, and she would be there for how long? Being fed of who? Of God or by Jesus. So, what's this 1260 days about? I have laid on you a day for each year, Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. So we know that in Bible prophecy, each day represents what? One year. So 1260 days represents what? 1260 literal Years. So this time period, the Bible says that this church, this woman that's being persecuted by the devil or the dragon, would go into hiding or go into the wilderness. It would have to flee persecution and go into this wilderness for how long of a period? 1260 years. So the popular church would reign while Christ's church would be in hiding. By the way, 
is they're usually, I'm sorry, let me rephrase it this way. When the early church, when the first Christian church started, was it the popular church? No. What was the popular church among the, the early Christians? It was the Jews. It was Judaism. They were Jews. They were the ones who believed in God. They were the ones who had the commandments. They were the ones who had the oracles of God. That was the popular church. But Jesus said after his death, you're going to go out and you're going to start a new church. And where were they supposed to start? They were supposed to start in Jerusalem and then go out to the outer ends of the earth, uh, to Samaria, then the outer ends of the world. Did that take place? That's exactly what happened according to the books of Acts. They started out in Jerusalem like they were told, then they went to Samaria, then they went to the outer ends of the world. But they were the minority church, they were the small church, and who was the one giving the Christians all the trouble in the very beginning of the church, in the very early stages? It was the Jewish church, it was the Jewish leaders. They wanted to make sure that Jesus was not the Messiah. They wanted to tell people it wasn't the Messiah. They wanted to kill people who were telling them that. And they were the one persecuting all of God's people. It wasn't the Romans that were persecuting the early Christian church. It was the Jews. And then later the Romans wanted to keep that influence with the Jews. They didn't like this Christian church starting up and causing so much influence amongst them. And so they started persecuting the church as well. But the Bible says that the church, his true people, would have to go into hiding because of this persecution for 1260 days or 1260 years while the popular church would continue reigning and do whatever it did. Rome fell apart in 476 AD, but a few years later, in 538 AD, Emperor Justinian crowns Pope Vigilus II leader of civil and religious act, excuse me, activity. I got to get drink water. This 1260-year period would end in 1798. Now, how would it end? Now, I've been over this three times, so I'm not going to go into it again. But General Berthier, Napoleon's general, would go down to the Vatican or to Rome, and he would take the Pope off of his off of his seat, and thus it would end. Satan attacked the Satan attacked the Church, but Jesus protected it. And in episode, we'll get to that in a minute. So we need to identify the remnant now. We need to identify the remnant. Number one, the remnant would arise after 1798. And I know that it arise after 1798 because how long was it in persecution for? Hiding in the wilderness, 1260 days, which ended in 1798. So this remnant church would have to come out of the wilderness or it have to be reestablished after 1798. Now, let's get the clues for the next two identifying characteristics. Episode 4, Revelation 12, 17. Episode 4, Revelation 12, 17. <coughs> Thank you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. We're going to look at the last episode of Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. So far we've seen that the devil has tried to attack God in heaven, and he failed there. Then he tried to kill Jesus before he could start his ministry, and he failed there. Then he persecuted and tried to destroy the early Christian church, and he failed there because the church went into hiding for 1260 years. But now what's the devil going to do? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the what? Testimony of Jesus. So the dragon now says that he's going to make war with the offspring of the church. So thank God, down at time, down at the end of time, are followers of Jesus. Notice how it describes the church. There's two indicators. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Just as faithful followers of every age would be faithful, so would these people. So who are these people? Hebrews 10, 16, the Bible says, I will put my laws in their where? Hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. Write them in our hearts so you love it, and write them on your mind so you know it. Jesus says that he's going to put his, his laws in our hearts so you love it, and our minds so you know it. In the last day, uh, church, he gives his people love for the law. Why? Because they love the Lord of the law. The reason why they love the law is because they love the Lord of the law. 
He gives them a love of the truth because they love the Lord who authors the truth. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 and figure out what this testimony of Jesus. The Bible says not only would they keep the commandments of God, but they'd have the testimony of Jesus. But what is the testimony of Jesus? There was two markers that the Bible gave us to identify this end-time church that the devil is going to persecute that arises after 1798. It says they will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19, verse 10. The Bible says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So what is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. So in other words, this remnant church, the two identifying marks, are they going to have the, 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 the keep the commandments of God, and they're going to have the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. Now, what is this talking about? 1 Corinthians 1, 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is waiting for the second coming of Jesus, and the Bible says that while they're waiting, they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit who would give them gifts. One of those gifts is the gift of prophecy. Jesus would raise up a last day biblical communion. These people love Jesus enough to obey him, and they would have the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy does not take the place of the Bible, but leads through the end times. Now we've seen three of the identifying marks of Jesus. And if you want to know more about the gift of prophecy, you've got to tune in tomorrow night or come back here tomorrow night at 7, and we're going to go through that in very great detail about just what that's talking about. But for tonight, for this presentation, for the purposes of our talk tonight, it's one of the identifying marks of this remnant church or this end-time church according to the Bible. So now we've seen that this church would arise after 1798, this remnant. It would arise after 1798. It would keep all the commandments of God, and it would be guided by the gifts of, or the gift of prophecy. What would be the next identifying mark? It would have more marks than just these three. What would be the next identifying mark? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Now, I haven't heard this here, but I've heard this in the past. People say, Jay, you sure quote Revelation 14, 6 through 12 a lot in the series. You come back to this verse, you come back to this passage quite often. And there's a very real reason why I do that. Because this is God's last message for his last day people. This is the last message that God gives us last day people to spread to the world. If it's the last day message for the last people on earth, how important do you think it is? How much should we know it? And that's why I keep coming back to it because God says, I need this message to get out to the entire world. Please preach this message. So I keep coming back to it. This is another marker of the remnant church. Let's look at it together. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. How widespread is this message supposed to go to? The entire world, and it's sent by an angel flying in the midst of heaven because it's important it needs to get out quickly. God says, I have a message that needs to go to the entire world. And this, of course, parallels what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Matthew 28, uh, sorry, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Let me sure, make sure I got that right. I believe that's right. Anyways, Matthew 28, last chapter, the last three verses of Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them things, teaching them all things that I have shown you. So Jesus gives his apostles a great commission. He says, you need to go out to the world, teach them everything that I've taught you, go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then in the end days, he sends a last day message that goes to the entire world. So the number four, the, the fourth mark, the fourth point to identify the remnant 
is it would be a worldwide movement. It would have a message and it would preach it to the entire world or to every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. So that means it must be an international body that's passionate about Jesus. It cannot be an independent church or non-denominational church. Why? Because according to the Bible, it would go to every nation, tribe, and people. Revelation 14 will continue and describe the last identifying mark that we will look at tonight. Revelation chapter 14 6 through 12. We just read verse 6, so I'm going to skip to verse 7 because we just read verse 6, but Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, we'll start in verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever whosoever, I'm sorry, whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of who? Jesus. So not only would this be an international church that would go to the entire world, but it would have a special message to give to the entire world. Wouldn't it be tragic to reject a message that Jesus just sent you? If Jesus has an important, a message so important that he's sending angels in heaven, flying through the earth, shouting, and sending a group of people all through the, the outer realms of the world to make sure everybody hears it, wouldn't it be a shame if we rejected that message? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if we rejected the very message that Jesus was trying to give us to give us comfort and encouragement and to prepare us for the final battle of the earth? Wouldn't it be tragic to reject that message? Let's go through the three angels' messages today. The first angel's message, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, it preaches about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a worldwide movement. It teaches us to fear God. It tells us because the judgment hour has come. It tells us to keep the commandments of God. And it tells us to worship God, the one who made, or in other words, worship the Sabbath, because that is the sign that you are worshiping the true God, the one who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that in them is. In the church you attend, do you hear the message of the first angel being met, being preached? If you do not, chances are you want to talk to your leaders and see why they're not doing that. Because God says this message should be preached to everyone. We move on to the second angel's message. Second angel's message, Revelation 14, 8. Babylon is a symbol of religious confusion. The wine of Babylon represents false doctrine. Babylon has committed spiritual fornication with the world. Do you hear doctrines or ideas preached at your church that do not harmonize with the word of God. Do they teach confusion? If you are hearing that, then the Bible says that you are in Babylon and the only remedy for Babylon is to get out. Impure woman equals impure church. And she's riding a beast. That means that the beast is being controlled by the woman and the beast enforces false worship. Woman isn't controlling uh, the spirit. She is controlled by Satan. In Revelation 18, there is a call. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. God says, you can't reform this church. You can't make it better. It's already rejected me. The only solution for this church is for you to leave that church and come to my one flock that I'm calling you into. God's last day people kindly and lovingly call out air that come into the church. Are there wonderful people in every church? Yes. There are, and that's why God asked me to give this message, because he is talking to them and saying, you are my sheep, you are my people. It's time for you to come out, because I have another place for you. I have a mission for you. What about the third angel? What's the third angel's message? Revelation 14, 9 through 10. The mark of the beast issue is over loyalty and worship. Church and state will unite and enforce the common day of worship. The Sabbath becomes a symbol of loyalty to Jesus. Now, number one thing we have to understand, nobody, how many people? Nobody has the mark of the beast today. 
That means that nobody has received the mark of the beast because it has not been enforced yet. Church and state have not united and forced Sunday worship or this false day of worship. It has not happened yet, but the Bible says that it will happen. And when it happens, it's going to happen on a global scale. And sure, it might start out locally at first, but it will keep growing and spread until the whole world is forced to worship on this false day because the issue at the end of time is not that you're worshiping because the Bible says everybody will be worshiping something, but the issue at the end time is over who you worship and how you worship. And God says that if you're in a church that's teaching confusion, come out because the devil's going to deceive you and you might not end up where you want to end up. Bible teaches God will have a people that will be loyal to him only worship when he says and how he says bible teaches that the sabbath is a symbol of that loyal the sabbath is a symbol of that loyalty the sabbath is a twofold memorial it's a memorial of creation he says keep the sabbath day because i made you and it's a memorial of redemption memorial of redemption because he says keep the sabbath because i'm the one who freed you from egypt and if god knows how to rescue us from sin if god knows how to free us from the prisons and the chains that we have bound ourselves to don't you think that he knows how best to live our lives the answer should be emphatically yes. So we should not fight God. We should surrender to God. Amen. And when God says it's time to move on, when God says I'm bringing you on a journey, it's time to start this process. We shouldn't fight against that journey. We should heed his voice because he's lovingly calling us and he's trying to help us. He's trying to bless us and give us something better. We should heed that call, surrender to his voice and walk in his footsteps. Amen. God's end time people. Sorry, in the dark ages, the, uh, the, uh, let me start over here. This would be a movement that encompasses all truth reformers taught. What truth is that? In the dark ages, we'll just start in the 1400s. You had the Waldensians. They taught about the Bible. Then you had Huss who came and he brought back our minds to obedience. And then Luther gave us grace and Calvin brought us the doctrine of growth. The Anabaptists brought us baptism by immersion. The Wesleyans taught us holiness and Millerites taught about the second coming of Jesus. But God's end time people would bring back the awareness of the Ten Commandments of God and not just the nine that most churches are keeping today, but the actual fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day. God starts it with the word remember because he knew that there was going to be a period of time when his people would forget what day it was. And so he'd say, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. And we saw earlier in presentations that how we worship indeed matters to God. He accepted Abel's worship, but rejected Cain's worship. When we don't worship the way that God is asking us to, we'll get the same response that he gave to Cain. He will come to us and he say, I don't accept this, but if you do right, if you do what I'm asking you, it will be accepted. It would be a movement, this end day people, be a movement that would bring us back to God and away from Satan's counterfeit. So here's the greatest issues. Satan's counterfeit. On authority, he says, let's use counsel. God's authority is the Bible. Uh, on prayer, Satan says, let's pray to images. God says, you just come to me yourself. I'm a living, present God. I'll walk with you. I'll be with you. I can hear you. I can do for you. I can see you. You just come to me. You don't need an image. On salvation, his count Satan's counterfeit is works. God says, no, 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 no. Your works will never be good enough. Just come to me and let me give you my grace. On, in, uh, on intercession, God, Satan's counterfeit is the priest. God's truth is that he sent Jesus. We don't need any other intercessor because we have the best one that ever lived. His name is Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross to earn the right to intercede for you. Worship, the Satan's counterfeit is Sunday. God's truth is Sabbath. On, 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 on death, Satan's counterfeit is the immortal soul. God's truth says we sleep. On baptism, Satan's counterfeit is sprinkling. God's truth is immersion. And on health, Satan's counterfeit is laws abolished. God's truth says my health laws are eternal. It would be a church that brings us back to God, a church where the people would not stop anywhere along the way, but they would keep accepting truth as it is revealed in God's word. They choose to follow God's truth as he reveals it to him. They understand that the truth in Christ's time uh, and in our time is never in the majority. It's never easy to follow. It never gets easier. It's just something that we do when we love Jesus Christ. Something that we do when we love Jesus Christ. So we ask the question, 
Who is this last day body of believers? Who is it? What will God's true church look like at the end of time? Here's the identifying marks that we've seen in the Bible tonight. Number one, they would arise after 1798. Number two, they'd keep all the commandments of God. Number three, they'd be guided by the gift of prophecy. Number four, it'd be a worldwide movement. Number five, they would have a special message from God himself to deliver to the entire world. It would be the church that follows all of these identifying markers. The only church, and I mean this, and of course you're going to say, of course you say that. But before I say what I'm going to say, I ask you this question. If you have seen proof and evidence from the Bible to support everything that I've said, if the Bible validates everything I've said tonight, then you can't simply just say that, of course, you would say that because you're a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You have to go back and you have to ask God, why did that minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, why did everything in the Bible corroborate everything that he said? You owe it to yourself to figure that out. Because if it's God's word, it's God's word, and it doesn't matter who's teaching it to us. It's God's word. And if God's asking us or telling us something in his word, it behooves you and it behooves me to follow his word. The only church that fits just these five is the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's the Seventh-day Adventist believers. You know, when I was a Bible worker, when I was a Bible worker, I believed strongly in one thing. I was called, I was, I, I, I'm sorry, I was led into the Seventh-day Adventist church. At a very young age, I was led into the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, I was raised an atheist, and I didn't accept Jesus until I was an adult, but I was raised, I, I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I was raised completely outside the church. I didn't have a church. I'd never, I went to the church maybe three or four times in my entire life because I probably had some neighbor friends who invited me to something and I probably just wanted to hang out and I went with them. And that's the only exposure I had to church when I was a kid. That was it. My grandmother didn't take me. My mom didn't take me. My dad didn't take me. My stepdad didn't take me. I don't remember going to church except for a handful of times. I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist. When I found Jesus, I gave my heart to Jesus. I did not give my heart to the Seventh-day Adventist church. I did not give my heart to any church. I gave my heart to Jesus. It was not a Seventh-day Adventist elder. It was not a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. It was not the Seventh-day Adventist church or any of their leaders or any of their members that met me in that car that day when I was going to take my own life and I cried to God for help. It was Jesus himself who sent the Holy Spirit to convict me and to comfort me and to soothe my soul and to give me the knowledge and the truth and the evidence that I needed to follow him. And that night I gave my heart to Jesus and I said, God, wherever you tell me to go, that's where I will go. I am not a lead. My allegiance is not to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's to Jesus Christ. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ. But I had this challenge. I said, Jesus, the only way I know I'm safe is if I follow your Bible. I want to be in the church that follows your Bible closer than any other people. I want to be in that church that always follows your Bible. And there is one thing I can stand up here and say that I am proud to say, and I know that we shouldn't be prideful, but I am proud of our church for this thing. Our church doctrines are not closed. If somebody developed truth that we did not know yet, if it became a doctrine, we would study that out. And if it was true, we would adopt that as truth because it would be God's truth. It would be God's word. And our church is built off of people who love Jesus and whose allegiance is to Jesus and who have given their hearts to Jesus. It is not to the church. It's not to the founding fathers of the church. It is to Jesus Christ because he is the one who saves us. He is the one who leads us. He is the one who died for us. We give ourselves to Jesus, and on that pathway, we go to where his truth is taught and where the body of believers follow his word closer than any other. When I was a Bible worker, I told everybody I knocked on that door, and I said, would you want Bible studies? And anybody who said yes, they're like, well, what do you mean? What are I'm a Baptist. I'm like, well, so what? They're like, well, what are you? I said, I'm a Christian. I have loved Jesus. I follow Jesus. And then I would even tell them, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Well, we're just going to disagree. I said, listen, I came here to study the Bible with you, but I'll make you one promise. We'll study the Bible together. And if you show me anything in that Bible that I don't know, and your church teaches it, and my church rejects it, I will become a member of your church the very next day. I follow Jesus Christ. I follow his Bible. I follow his word. 
I have had the privilege of studying with nearly every denomination out there. Now, I told you that there are over thousands of, uh, of Christian denominations, and, and that is true, but for the most part, there's not that many. They all follow the theme of other denominations just uh, on their own independent circuit, if you will. And so I have studied with Pentecostals, I've studied with Methodists, I've studied with Catholics, I've studied with Lutherans, I have studied with Episcopalians, I have studied with Presbyterians, I have studied with Baptists, I have studied with Church of Scientology, I have studied with many different religions, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, you name it. There's a good chance I've studied with them. I've studied with Hindus, I have studied with Buddhists, I have studied with many different people all around this country and in parts of the world outside of this country, and I can tell you this, I have not found a church that follows the Bible closer than the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the church that follows the Bible closer than any other church. And I can say that because I have studied with people from all other churches, including pastors and ministers alike. I have studied with them all. And I can tell you right now, it's our church. We're the ones who follow the Bible closer than the other church. It's us. God's last day people would be a church that follows these identifying markers. It would be the Seventh-day Adventist body of believers. Look what I found one denomination said. St. Catherine Catholic Church sentiment, May 21st, 1995. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day of the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become what? Seventh day Adventists. I didn't say it. A Catholic priest said it. And why did he say it? Because if you truly are going to be sola scriptura, if you truly are going to be the Bible and the Bible only, the church that follows the Bible and the Bible only closer than any other denomination out there is the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's the Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Now, I can assure you right now that this priest was in no way intending that people should leave the Catholic church and go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. That was not his intention. But brothers and sisters, just like Balaam, I'm, yeah, just like Balaam, he went on that mountain to curse God, his, or to curse the, God's people, the Jews, to curse the Israelites. He went up on that mountain to curse the Israelites, and he said, I cannot speak but what God puts in my mouth. And every time he went up there to curse them, even though his intentions were to curse them and, and to have them destroyed as a people and let this Moabite nation conquer them and take them out, even though that was his intention, he could only speak the truth of God. This priest might not have had the intention of people leaving the Catholic Church and becoming Seventh-day Adventists. He might have had the intention of other people in the other religion leaving the church and becoming Seventh-day Adventists, but he spoke the truth of God. If you want to follow the Bible and the Bible only, according to the Bible and everything that I have shown you, we are the remnant church. Not that God loves us more than any other church, not that God loves us more than any other people. Not that we're better people or better Christians. That is not what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible is saying that we're the remnant church because we have the fullness of the truth of Jesus Christ. And we preach it and we follow it. Now, you might find some in this church that don't follow it. And all I can say is that I'm sorry. That's all I can say. All I can say is that this is a hospital for sinners and we're all trying to get healed. We're all trying to find salvation for our souls, and we're all trying to grow. And, and this walk that Jesus gives us, and not everybody follows Jesus as close as they should, and not everybody who claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist follows our doctrines. But I can tell you this, the church doctrines, the official church doctrines, follow the Bible and the Bible only. So I ask the question, has God always had a remnant church on earth? Has there always been a remnant, a small group of people that followed God implicitly, even though others were not? Genesis 26, 5, Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Here's the thing. Abraham was not the first person that God called out of his family. He called his father first and he said, you need to get up and leave. And his father went so far, but he couldn't leave all the sin of the past behind. And he stopped in a city that was very familiar to his home city that worshiped the same God. And when God got done, when he exhausted his options with the father, he said, Abraham, you need to get up and leave. 
I've tried with your father. He's not going to follow me any further. I need someone. I need a man who will go all the way. I need a man who is fully surrendered, fully committed, and willing to walk wherever I tell them to walk and walk all the way into the promised land with me. Abraham, are you that man? And the Bible says, yes, he was. He didn't just stop on the road. He kept walking on that road as far as God led him and told him to go. Abraham and his family were faithful. Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, Therefore the Lord shall love, therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgment and his commandments always. God called the Jews, his people, out of Egypt and he said, I'm going to bring you out to a land that I want to show you, but you need to walk fully with me and you need to keep my commandments. Acts 5.29, But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Peter and the rest of the apostles followed God's truth. Will God's last day people follow his truth? Will there be people on earth that follow the Bible and the Bible only, even though the heavens are falling? Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. God says he will have a last day people. And what will they believe? They will have the faith of Jesus and they will keep God's commandments. God's last day people would be just as faithful as his first day people. It's a movement that he started when sin started, and he said, I need a group of people that will carry on my lineage. If the truth wasn't popular in Noah's day, it wasn't popular in Abraham's day, it wasn't even popular in Jesus' day, it wasn't popular in the time of the New Testament, it wasn't popular in the medieval ages, and it's not going to be popular today. But God says, I'm looking for men, I'm looking for women who won't stop, but they'll keep on walking in all the light that I give them. They will hear my voice and they will follow it. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. In heaven God's people will <clears throat> in heaven God's people will keep the commandments of God. So I ask the question again does God have a remnant church on earth today? John 10, 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. That flock is filled up of people that have heard God's voice and said, I won't stop until I get all the way to heaven. I won't stop until I follow everything God teaches me. You may continue this journey from the day you start until the day you die, but I can assure you this, you will not find a resting place because Jesus had no resting place. Jesus worked until the work was done, and now he's asking you and he's asking me to follow him until he's done with you. Yes, God's last day church is a Seventh-day Adventist church. God, Jesus, has true sheep in all denominations, but tonight he is saying, I'm calling them to my one flock. Revelation 18, 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues. God wants his true people to leave the air of man behind. He wants his people to follow his voice. Again, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. He wants his people everywhere to join this end time movement, this church that he himself and his teachings would be the head of. He is calling everyone into one flock, his flock. He's calling his faithful outside his church to get out and come into his remnant church. Larry was at home with his daughter Jennifer, and she was young, and he had run to the store really quick, but he was the only one home with her. So he waited for her to fall asleep, and he thought, well, maybe I'll have a few moments. I can sneak out while she's asleep. I can go to the store. It's only a couple blocks away, and I can come right back, and she won't know I'm gone, and she'll be safe here. It's a good neighborhood, and I really need to go. So very nervously, he quietly left his house, jumped into his car. He ran a couple blocks down to the store, and he picked up the items he had, and the whole time he had little Jennifer on his mind. And he's like, I hope she's okay. Pretty sure she's okay. I'm sure she's fine. I, I know and my wife will never not find this out. She'll kill me. And then he gets in his car, and he starts driving home, and he sees an ambulance with lights blaring, passing him. So he pulls off the side of the road, and he says, whoa, 
And then he gets back on the road and he sees that that ambulance is speeding faster towards his house. So he quickly runs there, and when he gets there, the house is on fire. And he starts running as fast as he can out of his car to the door, and the firemen stop him as he's running to the door, and they say, no one can go in there. He's like, my daughter's in there, my daughter's in there. He says, no man is going in there. So the father says, okay, Larry runs around the back of the house, and he says, Jennifer, are you okay? Are you in there? She says, daddy, daddy, help, the fire's up, the fire's going. He says, I know, hon, but you need to come to the window. You need to come to the window. So she crawls over to the window, and she says, daddy, daddy, what do I do? Help me, what do I do? And he says, Jennifer, you need to jump. You're going to have to jump. She says, but dad, I'm scared. I'm scared. And he says, I know, Jennifer, but you just need to trust my voice. You need to jump. You got to jump. I'll catch you, but trust my voice. Please jump. And that little girl loved her dad, and she trusted that voice. And she jumped out that window, and she fell safe into her dad's arms. Other firemen had tried to coax her into jumping, but she wouldn't heed their voice because it wasn't the voice of her dad. When Larry got there and said jump, Jennifer jumped, and she fell safe into her dad's arms. Jesus' voice is calling you. He's asking you to jump. And if you dare to jump, you will fall safe into your loving Father's arms, and he'll walk you all the way to the promised land. Amen. But you can't stop short at the window because there's a fire coming and God wants you to be safe from it. Who here is ready to follow the voice fully? Who here is ready to say, I want to go all the way? I want to follow God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you will bless. Bless us as we follow you. Don't let us stop short. Help us to follow your voice fully and surrender fully to you. We see that you're calling us out. We know that you have great plans for us, Lord. But there's no solution for Babylon. It's religious confusion, and it's not going to change. Your only, your only solution, your only message to us is to come out lest we share the sins of her people and join you in your one true flock where you're the one true shepherd. And you're the one true shepherd of that flock because everybody in that flock hears your voice and follows your voice, and proclaims your truth. We ask that you will make us more faithful, and that we'll be more like you in every day we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to remind you that tomorrow night we're going to go into the gift of prophecy. We've read about the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy. We go on that tomorrow night at 7 p.m. You will not want to miss it. Thank you for coming tonight, and we'll see you tomorrow at 